Thank you for watching the MAPS Global Podcast, where we discuss leadership and culture within the convergence of worship, prayer, and missions in your neighborhood and in the nations. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another special episode of the MAPS Global Podcast. Today is day two of annual gathering, AG24, and it's the morning. Um, We are doing prayer room hours right now and just experiencing the presence of God every time I walk in the prayer room. It's so fun. And and so I just grabbed three incredible people to sit down with me for 15 minutes to talk about moms in missions. And guys, they have been sharing nuggets over the past week and a half. It's been so powerful. Um, And I'm just so grateful that you guys are going to get to hear from these three amazing moms who work at three of our mission spaces. And so I'm going to introduce them to you now. So go ahead and just say where you work, how many kids you have, their ages, and how long you've been on the field. Um, I'm working overseas at the Levant mission space. We've been planted for now a year. I have two kids, one who's four. She's the most beautiful girl ever. And then we have a boy turning two in a few weeks. Oh, and he's massive. <laughs> he's a tank. He's, he really is. Yeah. Uh, we are in the Arab Gulf. We've been there for almost nine years, and our girls are about to be six and four. And your girls were both born overseas. Overseas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Yes, I also have young kids. So I have, well, I'm in the Middle East, been there for four years, and I have a five year old son who was born stateside and a three year old daughter who was born over there. And I'm 26 weeks pregnant. Woo woo! Um, Giving birth to number three over there as well. Amazing. Yeah. Okay, well, guys, I feel like we could talk for hours. Um, Literally, you guys have stories on stories. You have nine years of stories of mothering on the field. Um, Combined, you guys have like 20 years to talk about. (laughs) Um, But we have a few questions written down because you guys have said things, like I said, over the past week and a half that I just want to put out there for people that are, they're either in missions already and they're like, am I doing this alone? Is anyone out there who has the same experiences as me? And also just want to talk for people that maybe are considering missions and are maybe considering what would it be like to be a mom on the field? So let's start with that question. Like, what is the difference? What is it like parenting in the 1040 window in a Muslim context or whatever context you're in? How, how is it different to be a mom over there? Yeah, I would say we have been on the field for a year and some word of wisdom that was given to me a year ago before we moved, when I was getting all the questions as to why, I think that wisdom I was given was to make sure to separate um, being a mom with young kids and that being hard versus what is hard about the assignment overseas. And so I think that has been a filter for me every day now being overseas. I carry that with me like a nugget so that I can distinguish the challenges Mm -hmm. of being on the field while also understanding the blessings of the assignment, the blessings of being a mother and just knowing how to say what is hard. And sometimes when you just say, this is hard, Mm -hmm. it helps. Mm -hmm. And then to know, like you said, Jules, that it, it is hard, but you can be Um, on the field and still loving what you're doing and not being alone. Yeah. And you mentioned something you said earlier is like, you're you're a mom no matter what. And so you're like going to be wiping butts every day. Wiping butts. Changing diapers. Yes. Telling kids not to touch hot services and plants and all that stuff. Like you're doing that every moment of every day, no matter where you live. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And then you're navigating the cultural differences, which we can talk an entire hour on as moms having to articulate and explain to an elementary mind how things are appropriate and not appropriate. And that's another podcast, but, (laughs) but that's the wisdom you ask for every day as a mom on the field. Yeah. Three books. Yeah, I think, you know, and again, this happens stateside too. You're having to navigate the culture that you're in. And so for us, my kids are living in a country that's under Sharia law, mm-hmm. under Islamic law. They're hearing the call to prayer to go off five times a day. They're very much, they're mostly seeing covered women around them. Mm-hmm. So they have a lot of questions about just what is normal to them, especially when we come back from trips like this 
and they see Americans and they realize, oh, that's really different from where I live. Mm -hmm. So we're constantly navigating how do we answer the questions surrounding our culture? How do we give ourselves to the culture without... um, like without giving up parts of motherhood or parts of family that feel like, no, this is kingdom. This isn't yeah. just like Western Eastern culture differences. Yes. This is kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes, this is who yeah. our family yes. is. And so I think you have to do that whether you're a mom anywhere, but it's just a unique challenge when you're living under such a traditional, strong group culture mm-hmm. um, like we are. Okay. Yeah, that's that's an incredible point. So I think something that is distinct in being a mom overseas, especially with littles, is that you're in ministry. And then when you're overseas, ministry, and this could be ministry anywhere really, but it's ministry is almost Mm 24-7. But when you are a missionary overseas, the idea is to be married to the land, right? Spiritual language. Mm -hmm. The idea is to be all in, to be Mm -hmm. immersed, to be be a part of the people. But how much of that is, sacrificing your kids on the altar like that, that's kind of strong language but honestly sometimes I see it and not to not to judge other missionaries but it's kind of hard for me where you know I want my kids in bed by 7 p.m <laughs> you know I want them to sleep fully I want yeah. them to wake up happy and not grumpy and not but I do see other families you know their kids stay out till midnight 1 a.m because that's mm-hmm. the culture right. the culture in the Middle East is kids stay out till 1 2 a.m and I'm like should I be doing that? I don't think I want to do that. Is that what I'm supposed to be doing? Is that the right way? Am I supposed to let everybody grab my little introverted Mm three-year-old and kiss her and hug her? Or should I protect her? Because I know she hates that. And so there's like this, this dynamic, this tension that you have where you're like, okay, I I'm here to do ministry. I'm here to reach the people. I'm here to love and there's sacrifice in it. But I don't think I'm called to put my family on the altar that way. I want a healthy family. I want healthy kids who enjoy being out here and won't despise it in the future. And that that's something, I mean, I don't have it figured out, but it's something I think about all the time. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I would say what you're saying is actually something now that we've been one year on the field, we actually embraced the late night culture for six months. And then finally we've reached a limit to say that's actually Mm -hmm. not a family rhythm we're actually going to have for our family. For me, as my husband and I sat down, I remember it, and we said we're not going to embrace this part of the culture Mm -hmm. for the sake of our kids um, and their happiness and their ability to be alert and assertive the next day. So that is some a conversation that I have a lot with my husband as to what family rhythms are we going to cultivate here that mm-hmm. is different yes. than what our my daughter and my son is going to grow up in. Mm-hmm. And so that is still something we're, we're, we're navigating. What mm-hmm. rhythms yeah. as a family, and this was something before we moved overseas, we wanted to make sure rhythms we were building with our family actually was going to be contextualized. Yeah. So the rhythms that my husband and I created for our kids here, most have been able to transfer because of, I think, what would you call it? An adverb, a verb? We call it family fun. And Mm -hmm. every day we have family fun. And no matter what it is, this is rhythms that my husband and I have decided for our kids are going to happen anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so we traveled overseas now. We've been here a week, but we have made sure every day we're having family fun Mm -hmm. where it's just me, my husband, and my kids, and they know what that means. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about... um, what are some positives that living in a different culture has brought you as a mom? How have you seen it positively impact your kids? I would say one of the ways I've seen it positively impact my kids and me is that, I don't know, I guess this is just based on my friends who do mother in America. Mm -hmm. They talk about like, mommy wars, I think is what they call it. Something like where there's like this mom culture that's like toxic and unhealthy and it's Mm. um, like comparison and Mm. like everybody has to do it a certain way or else you're shamed and different things like that. I don't feel that at all. I feel like Mm. the moms on the field, we are like in it together. It is like we need each other. Mm. We are for each other. It doesn't matter what our differences is are we are a team and we're like hey how can I support you oh that's a good idea let me learn from that let me help you here um and so it just feels like a team like the moms in my life are like Mm -hmm. my champions you know and so I guess that has just obviously positively affected me and my kids because my kids are getting a better mom because I'm being authentic to who I should be I think in Mm -hmm. the kingdom and not just living in this 
world of comparison. Yeah. Um, hopefully not everyone listening is in that world, but sure. that's just what some of my friends have discussed. Like, in that same vein, you and I were in the car the other day just mm-hmm. sharing stories. And I just love that when mm-hmm. you have a spiritual family who are covering you, mm-hmm. you can pull on other moms in your family that actually I want to draw out of experience, especially another mom with more field experience, I've drawn on you. I mean, we've sent voice notes back and forth about what do I do? I'm trying to consider putting my kid in school. What did you do and what did you go through? And so that's, that Mm -hmm. just speaks to the value of spiritual family, Mm -hmm. other moms on the field, um, and just being able to draw from that. But I would say, Jules, to your question, just the positives, I think I've seen this in my four-year-old daughter, her world perspective, her biblical perspective. When I tell her to look out our window Mm. and see the Mediterranean Sea Mm -hmm. and to say, this is actually in the Bible. Mm -hmm. This is where Paul shipwrecked. Mm -hmm. This is all of a sudden I can tell that my daughter knows the Bible's real Mm -hmm. because we're opening up or even, or even when Jesus walked through Mm -hmm. an area in our country and healed a woman, Mm -hmm. I said that happened here. And so I just think that for me, the positive is that the Bible is alive and real and my kids know it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's powerful. That's so good. That's yes. super powerful. Yeah, I would say um, a positive as well. I think that word you used is really great uh, perspective. Um, my kids can be friends with anyone. My yes. kids are surrounded by a hundred different people who look a hundred different ways mm-hmm. and speak a hundred different ways, but they could care less. Mm-hmm. So my specifically with us in the Arab Gulf, they're around so many different types of people who it's look. It's like 200 sound, people groups that Yeah, live 200 plus. Not, yeah. yeah, it's crazy. And so my kids don't mm-hmm. care what anyone looks mm-hmm. like, dresses like, because we also have from the poorest of the poor to the wealthiest to yes. everything. And so my kids don't care. Mm-hmm. They can be around anyone. They can make friends with anyone mm-hmm. who looks like anyone, who speak mm-hmm. English, don't speak English. Um, I'm so grateful for that, that they get that perspective. And I think uh, the the fact that, our teams, our family, yes. that one is huge because one positive is the the opposite of one negative where we're not around grandparents, right? We don't yeah. get the grandparents. We don't get the aunts and uncles. Yeah. But our team, like what Jesus says, like, I will give you, oh, here we go. I will <laughs> give you, you know, you're, you are leaving father, mother, sister, brother, but I'll give these to you. Yes. I have lived that out. Mm-hmm. Like, and my kids are living that out where my kids have no idea that they are not cousins with the kids on our team. (laughs) They have no clue. They think they are blood related. Like I can't convince them otherwise. And that is something so, so special that is cultivated in a very special dynamic overseas because you feel so isolated sometimes, but it is so beautiful that you are family with people who are, who have, you have no DNA in common, but you are literal family. And I just want to, just harp on that for a second. That's a huge value of maps that we have is being on teams. We don't send lone rangers. We don't send a family by themselves. We don't send individuals by themselves, singles. Um, And it's not just because we can get more work done. Mm -hmm. It's because this is the model that we see in the Bible. And as you can see, you know, we're all tearing up because of the power that we've seen overseas of spiritual family coming together, ministering to the Lord and the ministry that can flow out of that. Mm -hmm. So go for a family. If you're thinking about going overseas, get in a spiritual family, come to MAPS. Um, Yeah, don't go alone. I don't think it would be possible. (laughs) Can I add a plug there? Yeah. You know, one of the things that we've noticed, we have a lot of singles and then a couple families, and we've noticed that the the kids on the team actually bring things that the singles need. So like Mm -hmm. physical touch, for instance, like Mm -hmm. I I tell them, come over for your physical touch quota. Just spend 10 (laughs) minutes at my house. Like that's your weekly quota is filled, I'm sure. Um, But really like just the sense of like belonging I, sometimes a five-year-old running into your arms and just saying, I love you mm-hmm. is exactly what the singles on my team need just to get through that day of mm-hmm. culture shock or language transition, learning. language learning, so yeah. many things. And so, you know, I think there's, a, you're right, like the spiritual family element of 
they don't just, it's not our kids assuming that we're blood relatives. Yep. It feels like we're blood yes. relatives. And it's yep. the, the singles on our team are feeling like, no, I really am your auntie. I really mm -hmm. am your uncle. And I mean, yes. they're like on our kids' school papers is like the emergency contacts. <laughs> like yes. you really are the aunties and uncles on our yeah. team. And so, or for our family. So yeah. mm -hmm. it's a reality. Yeah. And another thing that kids bring is kids and families, they bring stability. Um, we even see that in our short-term teams. You know, when we send we send students for 90 days, twice mm -hmm. a year, and I have noticed that the teams that do have a family on them, they come back with very different stories. Yeah. Um, because kids and family, they root, they yes. root you, they slow you down, yep. they <laughs> force you to um, engage in slower, more communal type stuff, like eating. Whereas um, for sometimes for like young 20s, young 30s, you could just roll in ministry, just like roll, roll, mm -hmm. roll, and just like blaze out and not even realize you're doing it in the name of missions and ministry. But when you have kids, you can't. They force you. Like you're saying, you know, my kids just have to sleep at 730. But you know what? Like that's also forcing you to sometimes sleep early. And then you wake up and you're refreshed and can actually put your hands to more work because you're eating, you're drinking, you're sleeping, you're resting, you're playing. Like, and these are things that are, are necessary to life. Because when you're a missionary, you don't stop doing all that stuff. You don't just give your yes and suddenly like everything is hard. Everything's awful. Mm -hmm. You're working your, your, tush off. And, and when you come back to the States, then you're going to rest. It doesn't work like that. This is sustainable. So yes. families, if you're thinking about going overseas, you're actually bringing an anchor to the team you're with. You're bringing so sustainability. There's just so much that we could say. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, you know, something that is super powerful about being a family is that you most likely are eating meals at the table. Yeah. And I think that is a lost art of family. Absolutely. And even in the relationship uh, um, relating to teams, is like if you sit at the table, you're going to have food, fun, fellowship. And families have that. And so we've seen singles come to our table. And with our kids, the level, the depth of conversation that comes up, that if we were just all a, a team of singles, we would be eating on the run. Mm -hmm. And I exactly. think the lost art 100%. of eating at a table, yeah. and this would be either on the field or, you know, stateside, I think that kids help bring those kinds of anchors. You're talking Absolutely. about, Jules, as a family, that we've seen singles, you know, Un unravel at just the ability of feeling loved and feeling like I haven't had a homemade meal in a really long time. Yes. And they are being part of the family. Yes. You know, they're being brought into the family. And I think that that is a beautiful testament to families on the field. Yes. Yeah. Um, and being a mom where you're in the kitchen, you know, it's the heart of the home, right? And we've just seen... Mm -hmm. As a mom, for me, I'm starting to enjoy cooking the local food. Mm -hmm. And locals are being ministered by that. Mm -hmm. And just by being a mom who's like, it is dinner time. I need to make food for my kids. Can I make you something? Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a ministry that um, I've seen already. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So let's go ahead. I want to jump in um, to a specific question. Uh, I want to talk about some sacrifices that you guys have made. Um, I know specifically for Miss Middle East mom, Miss Arab Gulf mom, there's some two specific stories with your daughters that um, in the past few few years um, that I've gotten to hear that have really, really impacted me, have really impacted a lot of people and um, have helped to really give language to what what kind of sacrifices you have to make and if it's worth having a family on the field and just your process. So um, would either of you be willing to share your stories? Okay, I'll go first. Um, yeah, so in 2020, life was terrible, not because of COVID. Um, <laughs> COVID had a part to play, but we were overseas. But in our in our country, there was actual lockdown where you can't leave your house lockdown, like mm -hmm. without a permission slip and all the things. Mm -hmm. um, but I was pregnant at the time. And my oldest was one and a half. And so I got sick. I had hyperemesis and placenta previa, which is basically you don't stop throwing up. Uh, if you move, you throw up. And then placenta Oof. previa had to be hospitalized for. So it's, it's a long story, but essentially I was having bleeding episodes. And um, yeah, I had to be hospitalized at 25 weeks. Oof. And... Um, I was hospitalized for six weeks, and because it was COVID, I couldn't see my daughter. So I missed 
total, I missed six months of my baby's life. Um, yeah, so that was a sacrifice. And because it was COVID, everything was locked down. We couldn't have any income. So, and we didn't have a team at the time, actually, because they were all in different places. And so it was just my husband and my little one. Uh, so he was a single parent for six months while I was in the hospital. Um, and yeah, that was, that was just, that was hard in and of itself of not seeing my little one and just really desiring her to be loved. Um, but yeah, six weeks in the hospital and essentially what the doctors told me is you just have to wait for the emergency to happen. You're not going to make it to full term. Uh, we're just waiting for the big, the big bleeding episode where we have to stop you from bleeding out. So that was great. <laughs> so I'm just sitting in a hospital, um, a government Islamic hospital with the call to prayer five times a day going off um, by myself. My husband could only come see me every two days uh, or every other day, but he would come faithfully. Uh, our beautiful, beautiful uh, Arab neighbors took care of the little one so he could come see me for an hour every other day. And we would just take communion. And um, I... Uh, I was just sitting in a bed uh, by myself, just, just waiting for the emergency. And I remember looking up online, like, like women who had gone through this and were hospitalized. How did you get through it? How did you get through this? And every list and every hacker, you know, how to get through was people visiting me, got me through. My kids coming to visit, got me through. Friends bringing food, got me through. I'm like, okay, none of those. I can have nothing that got these women through. Great. I remember being so frustrated by that. Um, it was it was actually very angering. I wasn't a very good Christian at that moment. Um, but the emergency came. And as COVID rules lifted, um, this couple from North Africa came uh and they said, We'll take care of your baby while your husband takes care of you. And again, team, team yeah. guys. And I had um, my baby, a girl at 30 weeks. And um, yeah, I had to do it alone. It was an emergency C-section because my husband was not allowed in the room, which was my worst nightmare. I, they, I remember being wheeled in and I was like, please let him come in. Please let him come in. And um, they were like, nope, can't do it. And I'm like, I'm just freaking out. Um, <laughs> but I remember saying to the Lord, like, okay, God. As long as I hear her cry, I know she's breathing. Because that's like the big thing when they're yes. born premature. I'm like, okay, if I hear her cry, I know she's okay. And so I'm alone in the, in the operating room. My, my, I remember the anesthesiologist was getting so annoyed by me. Because I was like, is everything okay? Is everything fine? Is everything good? Is she okay? Am I okay? Are we okay? He like pumped me full of drugs to shut me up. Because yeah. <laughs> I didn't have anyone there. I'm like, so, but I remember she, she was born and I heard her cry. Mm. And I've never breathed a bigger sigh of relief in my entire 35 years of life. I guess then I was 34, but um, 33. I just breathed a sigh of relief. And from there, though, y'all, like, she was fine. Like, she was born in 30 weeks, no complications. She did need oxygen. Like, day one, they took her oxygen tubes out. And, yeah, that was... She was, she was fine. She was, she just gained weight and we brought her home and 2020 was horrible. Yeah. And the next year was like the best year of our lives. Yeah. But yeah, that was, that year was the year. My husband and I are pretty, um, we're pretty okay going overseas. Like we're not, we're not weeping over leaving. Like actually it wasn't that big of a sacrifice when we went over, mm -hmm. even being married and we were like, okay, we missed a couple holidays. It actually wasn't a big deal for us. Mm -hmm. It was the first time I ever felt the sting yeah. of sacrifice yeah. of, I can't call my mom. Yeah. I can't call grandparents. I can't call aunts, uncle. Like there's no one I can call to help. Like, even my spiritual family isn't there, right? Because it was COVID, people were everywhere. It's so, like, I can't, it was, I couldn't call for help. Yeah. That was the first time I ever felt the sting of living overseas. And the thought of like, is this okay? Mm -hmm. Like, are my kids going to be okay with, with this decision I'm making? Mm -hmm. um, and there's no like overt spiritual, like, like, I don't have an awesome, like, I was brave and courageous type thing. It was like, it was hard. Yeah. 
it was hard and I was upset and I was disappointed and I felt the lack and, Mm -hmm. but it, there was an ending to it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so even though no, God didn't heal me, like the emergency happened, Mm -hmm. but I, and I just got this word. This is crazy in the prophecy room. Like he's still, he was holding us the whole time. So even though we felt the sting and it was hard and I didn't get healed, I know that he held us even through mm-hmm. all of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. To, I'm having a hard time. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I just. Oh. Yeah, before I even share my story, I just want to say, like, you know, after I had our health scare, I started asking the same questions. Like, and when I said, you know, I, the thing that happened to me after really I walked through a season of healing from this, the question was, like, if that happened again, would it be worth it? Mm. (laughs) And I knew that I knew that I knew that it was worth it because Mm -hmm. what it did is it put a different type of reliance on Jesus. And even in missions, we can do it in our own strength. Mm -hmm. We can, sometimes we can take the sacrifice and go, oh yeah, okay, we can still do this. Like, it'll be fine. We got this. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. when you have moments like that, it resets you again to write what matters and to Mm -hmm. fully depend on Jesus. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I just want to affirm, like, he did hold you. Mm -hmm. He did. And it's evident by the way that your family is, is today, (laughs) that he has held you and is actually strengthened you and redeemed you from it and there was one thing you said when you shared before um that you mentioned just this concept of like is is this nation worth giving my oh yeah giving my oh yeah i because i remember you know i know i can i mean I, i know a handful of stories of missionaries who lost their kids there's actually a a story of a family in the arab gulf who lost their two girls to disease Um, this was back, you know, in 1800s, but, um, I just remember thinking that thought and I'm like, no, (laughs) what? Mm -hmm. No, that's not, I'm not doing that. Yeah. No, no, these, I mean, again, just very unmissionary like talk. I was like, no, this land is not worth it. Mm -hmm. These people are not worth my baby. Absolutely not. (laughs) Like I had all these thoughts. Um, that I was like, wow, I guess I'm not superwoman. I, you know, I guess I'm not awesome totally. superwoman yeah. missionary person who I thought, like, mm-hmm. I'm going to, like, save the world for Jesus. Like, wait a minute. I'm not that person. And it goes back to exactly what you just said. It's like, it really does reset you. Like, okay, I'm here because the Lord has called me and I believe he's faithful, not because I have it in me yep. to to sacrifice. Because obviously I don't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> obviously I don't. Because again, I, I was like, I remember saying, I don't know if I said it out loud because I was in hospital with like six other Muslim women. But I was like, no, I'm not doing this. But yeah, again, like, oh man, God is so kind. Yeah. He's so kind and he's so loving and he's so faithful that he met us there, right? He met us there. Like we were able, I was able to meet local people in this context and, and just, just the whole long list of things where even in my, in my distress and my anger and my frustration, like of the sacrifice, like he still met me. Yeah. Yeah. He still met me. We didn't go home. We didn't leave. We didn't, we actually got even more settled and, you know, rooted in the land. And I was like, I don't know. It's, it's all him. It's all him. There's nothing I can manufacture or do or stir up in myself. Yeah. Absolutely not, obviously. But man, man, did he did he meet me there? And that that sacrifice you've mentioned that whether you wanted to make it or not, you made it, mm-hmm. and it it launched a season of fruit oh in your gosh. ministry. And yeah. you went from a few years of you know working, pioneering, then you put the seed in the ground, you know, and and then. M- People getting saved, going into labor camps. Like oh, everything blew up. Stuff it, it just completely, 2021 was ridiculous. Yeah. And I know it's not a formula. It's not like a vending no. machine where it's like, God, I'll give you my best sacrifice. And then you're going to pour your spirit on my ministry. It's, you never wanted to do that. But there was a seed in the ground that the Lord like watered. 
Um, so let's hear a little bit um, from you. Whatever you want to share. You don't have to share the whole thing. But. Yeah, I'll just share the high-level overview. But yeah, so we were traveling actually back for AG last summer. Mm -hmm. um, and just a crazy series of events. You know, you, that horrible email you wake up to the day of your flight that says your flight's canceled. We don't have any other plans for you, basically. Um, so we ended up getting put on a long, rerouted trip through London. And anyway, one of the first flights we were on, um, my daughter and I were sharing a row right behind a family um, of refugees that had probably just crossed the border pretty recently. Um, and unfortunately, their son had like explosive diarrhea all over the airplane. It was really bad. Um, Sorry for all the graphic language in this podcast. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For the moms. Like, yeah. I know. Does this yeah. deserve the E? That is. Yep. <laughs> this deserves the E for explicit. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so we, uh, my daughter had been like sharing toys with him and having fun and all this mm -hmm. stuff. And honestly, I was like grossed out, but I wasn't like living in fear. I was just like, oh, that's really gross. Okay, let's like wash our hands or whatever. But whatever what it was settled into her system and my system. And by the time we were on our second flight, I was getting medical like help on the airplane and then like fainting and passing out and all this horrible stuff. And then by the time we landed, my daughter was throwing up and then we got to the hotel, had to cancel our plans for the connecting flight. And my husband starts throwing up and we're like, okay, this is just a horrible bug. <laughs> like we caught that horrible bug. And essentially for the next two weeks, we were in and out of three different hospitals trying to figure out what she had because she was losing a third of her body weight and it was just wild. So yeah, she caught a horrible, like three strains of E. coli and Shigella and norovirus and just like, it was, it was hell for us. Um, and and in, the, in the midst of that, also dealing with seizures. Yes, yeah. yes. And she had febrile, she has febrile seizures. So she was seizing a couple different times, super high fevers, and they would yeah. come out of nowhere. So yeah, it was really, really intense. Um, and at one point, like the card was on the table that she may have something that was life-threatening where like 5% of kids make it, you know, just like the things you cannot bear to even believe that you could possibly hear as a mom. And so I was a wreck. I mean, I was, to I was literally at the end of myself, like, God, I'll do anything if you can spare her life, anything if you can spare her life. And for sure, asking the questions. Like, yeah, I love how you say I wasn't a good missionary. I don't know what a good missionary is, but I wasn't dead either. Um, so weak, so, um, you know, your most vulnerable, like, emotions in life. The most natural thing in the world for me is to try to protect my kids. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing I could do. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it was it was truly horrible. Praise God, um, a couple weeks later, she was making it through and she didn't have the horrible thing that the doctors were kind of thinking it w might be. And, you know, you can always, in hindsight, you can see like a thousand different ways God was working on your behalf, yeah. even in the midst of yeah. hell. Uh -huh. And so, you know, we had this Christian doctor who came in who was like, hey, you've been testing for this, but I think you need to test for this. And, and she prayed over us and just like all of those like wow. precious things that like... Yeah, again, it was just like God intervening and yes. saying, I'm going to make a way for you here. Mm -hmm. um, and then AG started the day after she got out of the hospital last year. And so I was just like, God, I don't even know what I need, but I am so weak. So I just need you to just touch me this week. And I was basically yeah. just coming in like that. Like, I don't have anything to give anyone. I just yeah. am here and I need to yeah. receive from you. And a couple of days later, I just had one of the most powerful encounters of my life where um, actually Mike Miller was here um, preaching um, that night. I think it was actually his wife preaching. I don't know if it was I preaching. Remember. They were just I talking. Remember. There was and no it was the preaching. Floor. They yeah. were on the floor. just yeah. presence. <laughs> it was powerful. And I was, um, I was laying down, or I just suddenly was like face down. And they're preaching out of Luke 7, I think, or Luke 8, the woman um, at Jesus' feet, washing his feet with her tears. And mm -hmm. I, I saw this image of myself doing that. And then as I was doing that for like a long time, suddenly I felt his tears drip on my back, that he actually leaned over and was, he was crying with me as I was crying with him. 
and that like my tears were moving him. My tears were causing his response. And I was just like, oh my gosh. And people came up and they're praying over me and like prophesying all this stuff. And everything was just lifting suddenly. Like it was just like lifting off of me. And I was just like so overwhelmed. And I was like, God, what do I do to be healed? And he said, this, Mm. this is what you do to, you let my tears wash over your tears. Mm -hmm. That's how you'll be healed. And it was so, so powerful. Like I, obviously it didn't take away the pain. It didn't take away (laughs) the hell that we had gone through, but suddenly it gave me like peace and it, yeah. and it was like, okay, I don't, I don't know. I don't know why any of that happened, but I know that if this happened again, yeah, right. If, if anything happened again, he will meet me and he will cry with me over my own tears and over my own daughter's life and pain and all of that. And it just, yeah, it just flipped a switch for me that it's just going to be okay. (laughs) And really, I mean, that moment like marked me personally in my relationship and my, that reset moment for me with Jesus that like this entire last year, whenever I'll have just a moment of being like, Oh God, I'm feeling flustered. Like, where are you? He just brings me right back to that Mm -hmm. moment. And it's just been like an anchor for me. And so I'm as much as I don't want those moments, we do not choose that way of sacrifice. We do not choose that way of encounter. Um, he does meet us yeah. and does like set us on a trajectory for more intimacy and mm-hmm. like sustainable intimacy to keep running and yep. yeah, keep going no matter what happens. Yeah. Thank you guys for sharing those stories and just helping um, put real real life to Mm -hmm. what it means to be a mom on the field and give your life. Mm -hmm. As we wrap up, um, I wanted to tackle this question quickly um, so you guys could just give a super short answer. Say I was a mom and I'm considering or just I'm a young, just got married considering the field um, or I'm pregnant or I'm a mom already and I'm thinking about missions. Um, What what would you say to me? Like, can I do it? I would say I'm taken back to what my personal experience was. What I um, brought before the Lord is I need a word over each of my kids that you give me Mm -hmm. to remind me on the field what you say about them. Um, And so I've been reminded when things have been hard that, God, you said you will preserve their heart. You said said this. And I I remind myself and I remind God on the field when it's hard, this is actually um, what you say about my kids. And I think that that has helped me be a mom. And be a good one and tr- try, try my best and give the weak yes and that that's enough. And so, yeah, mm-hmm. the answer to your question would be that is what it took for me. And that is what allowed me to just give a weak yes and just say, God, this is your word and this is your promise over my kids. And this will be the true overseas. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. that's what I would say. Wow. I But I would say moms, like you can do it. Like you're hearing from moms with experience on the field and we're going through hard stuff and so are you like if you're listening to this podcast you're probably going through things that are hard and you don't have to do it alone and so you're hearing us say we're drawing on each other on a spiritual family like go on the field with family a spiritual family to cover you and you will make it yes you will make it and god will take a weak yes no matter how weak it is Even if it's a maybe, like he will run with that Mm -hmm. and he will blow your mind at what it looks like to be a family on the field, what it looks like to be husband, wife. That's a prophetic picture of the church, Mm -hmm. what it means to have kids and to love them. It's going to be a testimony to anyone around you. I would say I would... I would always rather be where the invitation from Jesus is that he is. Yeah. And that's what it is for me. Mm-hmm. Like if it was, if he called me to Canada, whatever, like, I mean, I don't, Lord, please know. But it, it's uh, <laughs> like, like for me, it's yeah. like, no matter where you're called, the point is that he extends his hand. He extends this invitation yeah. and there's just a depth 
that you go with the Lord when you just say yes to the invitation. Mm -hmm. So anyone listening, I I don't know, we just met a couple who are like pioneering Alaska. It doesn't, the where doesn't matter, right? He picks the where. He he takes you. But I I think what it is, is that when he extends his hand, Mm -hmm. when he extends his invitation, when you say yes, I'm just like, okay, Lord, whatever else happens, happens. But there's just something. There's this, it's beyond description, what you find in Jesus when you just accept the invitation and you go. And the thing that happens as as a family, when you go as a mom, you go as a family, there is a slowness and a weakness um, that you're going in, you know, because you're like, I have to keep people alive and fed and butts wiped and all the things, but there's this weakness and humility you're going in that I cannot describe the dependency on Jesus that nothing else could draw out of you, yes. but doing this. Yeah. And so it's, yeah, it's other than, it's hard to describe, but I would say, take his hand, say you're weak, yes, or maybe to the invitation and just go, just go. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, I think, uh, gosh, you guys have said everything, really. But, um, okay, so we know the promise from Jesus is lose your life and you will find it, right? And so I think it's the same in motherhood. It's like Mm. there's so many things that maybe I thought my motherhood should look like or I thought my life on the field should look like and actually losing those things and losing the expectation of whatever those things were and the life that he's given me has been so much more abundant. It's been so much more fulfilling. And when I love what you said about the invitation, when you accept that invitation, it's like just like grace after grace after grace that he provides. Um, and yes, it's hard, but like pick your hard. <laughs> what right, what right. is your type of hard? Because there right. is hard in everything. Yes. And the hard, but the the hard with the acceptance of this is from Jesus means that there is grace for that kind of hard, yes. not oh, just yes. Yes. pushing through to push through. And yes. so, man, just embracing his assignment in motherhood and missions has been one of the most fulfilling parts of my life. And I'm, I'm sure you guys can say the same. Amen. And so, yeah, you can do this. And you we want to instill this. courage yes. in any moms yes. that are out there. If you are pregnant, you can have babies on the field. Hallelujah. We've had <laughs> three, one on the way so far. Hallelujah. You probably have. We want more. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> They'll have course. more. If you are newly married, we have newly married people on the field. Yeah. Like you, yeah, no matter what, like you can bring your families on the field. And I just, yeah, we have, we could all sit around seven this table. babies on our team. Let me tell you, seven kids. Seven wow. kids. I love it. We, we are always amazed at, um, the impact that a family moving overseas has, not because they're more effective than a single, but because the culture goes, oh, you're willing to raise your family over here? And that that warms the people's hearts in a a really specific, tender way. So praise God for that. You can do it. You can do it. Wow. Thank you guys so much for your time. This has been amazing. So many tears. We cried together. The whole journey. Yes. <laughs> it wouldn't be missions, motherhood, whatever this is called, without yeah, tears. It would not. Without tears. It would no. not. Nope. Well, if you watch this and there's any interest in you um, of finding a missional family, if you want to check out maps, hear a little bit more about what we do, you can go to our website. Um, we have a training application you can find. Um, you can DM us on Instagram. And uh, we'll see you on the next podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the MAPS Global Podcast. Make sure to subscribe to this channel and check out previous episodes. Have you seen our 50 Hours documentary? Watch it now. And don't forget to sign up for our email newsletters.